Um, just uh, one or two notices. But first of all, I'm going to read Bands of Marriage. A published Bands of Marriage between Harry Spencer Bourne and Chloe Jean Fries, uh, both of St. Michael's Braintree. And this is for the second time of asking if anyone knows any reason in law why the, the, this couple ought not to be joined together in matrimony, you are to declare it today. If you've got your notice sheet, there are one or two things to uh, underline, and every, well, everything there is important, but, but um, can I remind you, please, about... Yes, th oh, yes, thank you so much. Can I remind you, pre please, about uh, just 26th of August? You see that on the notice sheet. Um, and there's a sign-up sheet at the back to hear Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, in uh, the London Excel Centre. Please look at that. Um, I'm just looking for Rachel. Has she come across yet? Oh, Rachel, would you, would you talk about this? This is just off the cuff, but could you just say something about the summer club nights and Smash Extra? Absolutely. Yep, so this Thursday, the 20th, we've got um, our final um, club night. Uh, those in year six and of secondary school age are very, very welcome to come along. Uh, there's going to be pizza, there's going to be origami, there's going to be other things going on. Um, so just speak to me if you want to hear more information about that. And then on the 28th of July, the first Friday of the school holiday, at three to five, um, we've got an event here called Smash Extra. We've got activities all around church uh, for families to engage in. And then we'll come together at 4.30 for a praise party. Um, and we'll hear a Bible story as well. Rachel, thank you very much. That's lovely. That's good. <clears throat> on the 29th of July, you will also see on your notice sheet, notice sheet there is to be a walk in the countryside. So please, can you uh, note that? Um, I omitted to read uh, another set of bands of marriage, so I'll do that now before our service begins. That's between Thomas Allen James and uh, Chloe Mercedes James, uh, of both of this parish. This is for the second time of asking. So again, if anyone knows any reason in law why they should not be married, you are to declare it today. Well, uh, Cyril is going to lead our service now, and uh, it would be good if he was, would be, was able to come and lead us in an opening prayer. Come on now, Cyril, you're okay there. Actually, before... Um Before I uh, start the service proper, and uh, thank you, Stephen, for mentioning about Franklin Graham, um, but um, as you know, we've, we've got a coach going, and the important thing is that if any of you actually have a friend or somebody else that you can take along, please try and encourage them. And for the rest of us, please pray that there will be more people um, coming along with friends. As so many of us benefited from friends praying for us and uh, us going along to uh, Billy Graham's uh, crusades. But first of all, we've got a short video um, in, of introduction. We'll see that first, shall we? Right now, I'm in uh, London, England, and of course, this country has had such a huge impact, not only on the world, uh, but the church. Uh, so many missionaries came out of this country, taking the gospel around the world. This country has changed so much in the last uh, 20, 30 years, but uh, the needs of the human heart have been changed. People are still searching, they're still looking, but they don't even know what they're searching or looking for. Uh, there's a hole, there's a vacuum, there's that emptiness, there's that longing that only God himself can fill. And that can only happen when a person comes into a right relationship through faith in Jesus Christ. 
Yeah. Um, it's just to say, for old blokes like me who are a little bit deaf, can we turn up the sound just a titch so that we can hear a little bit more? It's a bit soft for me. It probably is right for you, but then maybe one or two others who can't hear the good Cyril. <laughs> <laughs> the good Cyril, I like that. <laughs> so, as we come to the beginning of our worship period proper, let's have a prayer together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you because of your promises that are true every morning. We praise you for the wonderful deeds in our lives. Your grace has enabled us to gather here to worship. We glorify your name for always being there for us. You promise never to forsake us or, or leave us. May you help us to worship you in truth and spirit to the honour of your name. Amen. Now, we were just watching a short video of uh, some good music, but uh, what better way to start a, um, a service than with a prayer of, a, a hymn of thankfulness to follow prayers of thankfulness. And you can rely on Getty and Townend uh, to prove, provide upbeat tunes uh, for, uh, for lifting our spirit. So please, if you're able to, stand. Uh, the words will be on the screen, but it's Mission Praise 1209 in your booklets at the end of the pews. Okay, please sit down. Right, well this is what I call our hit and miss slot. 
Um, because we ask each week, has anybody uh, under the age of 11 had a birthday this week? Do we have any hands up? Are we going to be a book-free week this week? Oh, that's a shame. What about those who are over 11? Over 21? <laughs> over 51? <laughs> over any age? No? Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, well, we move on then. How many of you remember Skiffle? <laughs> We're going to be singing. He's got the whole world in his hands. And now, those of you who remember Skiffle, how many of you remember that in 1958, this song was a worldwide hit? Yeah, there's a few of us do, yeah. It was sung by a chap called Laurie London. And uh, he was billed as the boy singer because he was 14 at, at the time. Uh, I remember that he had these extraordinary long arms that seemed to flail around uh, everywhere. But the amazing thing was that this was, as I say, was a worldwide hit. People were singing it all over the world. And in fact, before the Beatles, Laurie London was the most played, and this song was the most played uh, tune on American music radio stations um, at the time. And so, uh, yeah, he, he got there before the Beatles did. So please stand. And we, now, I'm sure in the video there will be actions. I've not seen the video myself, but there will be actions. So let's please stand and sing, and uh, if you can, please do the actions as well. I meant to say, for those who had their hands up afterwards, the uh, children can go and ask their grandparents what Skiffle was. Uh, in a moment, the uh, children and their leaders will be leaving us for junior church. Uh, while we sing the hymn Mission Praise 987, here is love vast as the ocean. But before the children go out, before we stand to sing a prayer for the children, Jesus Christ, Prince of Life, we give you thanks for the young people you have given into our care. As we sing of the wonders of your love for us, we pray that our children will be guided into a full knowledge of all that you have done for us and for them. Bless their group leaders with a spirit that will light up your word as they share together the precious stories of all that you have done for your people. Even at an early age, may seeds of truth be planted 
and growing in their lives. Amen. So please stand again and the children and the young people will leave and we'll sing the hymn 987. Please be seated, and if you can find your blue cards at the uh, end of the pews in the little boxes. Now we've gathered in God's presence, and it's wonderful to know what a privilege that is. But God is holy, and we know that we are not. So how is it possible for us to be here? Confession of our sin is not a magic potion, but an amazing act of grace by a God who is always waiting to listen to us and waiting for our return. So please, please join with me in the words of paragraph six, if you are able. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be. And we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you and our God. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now Margaret is going to lead our prayers. Let's begin these prayers this morning by joining together in the Lord's Prayer at section 9 on the blue cards. Together we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. In the prayers that follow, when I say, 
Lord, in your mercy, please respond, hear our prayer. Dear Lord, we know that our world is in a sorry state, torn apart by violence. We pray for countries where there is war, not just in Ukraine, but in countries ravaged by civil war or terrorised by brutal, marauding, militarised groups. We pray for all who seek to bring peace in areas of conflict. Please give them wisdom and determination. We pray for courage and help for the thousands of people in so many areas who have been driven from their homes as refugees. We pray too for all who work with aid agencies, especially for all working with such refugees, asking for strength and courage day by day in their work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we think of our own country, Lord, we pray for his majesty the king and the royal family that they may look to you for the help they need. We pray for the government and for members of parliament of all parties that you will give them wisdom in their decision making as they seek to deal with the many problems we face as a nation today. Lord, we long for integrity and honesty in government, and we pray especially for all Christian members of Parliament. Please give them the courage to stand up for their beliefs and make them light and salt in all they do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord, for your church worldwide that your people, wherever they are, whatever their circumstances, may rejoice in your love. We pray for our mission of the month, the Church Pastoral Aid Society, that in its work of enabling the churches and congregations in its care, it may serve you faithfully and be a blessing to those to whom it ministers. And we pray especially this morning and this summertime for all who run the CPAS camps and house parties, and for all who will attend them this summer. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Here at St Michael's, we thank you for all who lead us in whatever capacity, and ask that you will bless the time spent in your service and increase their and our love for you day by day. We pray for the forthcoming children's activities, the summer club night and the smash extra. Thanking you, Lord, for Rachel and for all who work with our young people. And as the school year draws to a close, we pray for all who will see, soon be leaving school, either primary school like those from St Michael's or John Ray, or those leaving secondary school for higher education or for the world of work. Please help them to face the ch these changes with courage. And for those who already know you, we pray that they may have the assurance that you will go with them into their future. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for those in our church family and for others known to us who are going through tough times because of illness bereavement, anxiety, family breakdown, loneliness, or unemployment. Please help each one to know that they and their circumstances and needs are known by you and that you are there with them, whatever they are facing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In a few moments of quiet, let's name before God those who are particularly on our hearts at this time. Lord, in your mercy. And as we draw this time of intercession to a close, here's a prayer for ourselves. The special prayer for today, the collect for the sixth Sunday after Trinity. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. 
pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's sum all, up all these prayers in the words of the grace at section 11 on the blue service cards. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you, Margaret. As we let those uh, prayers think, sink in, when we say the Amen, are we always confident that God has been listening? Now, our next song reminds us that nothing is impossible with God as it lists the miracles our Saviour has done and what he has achieved through his love. Now, after we've sung this hymn, Peggy will be bringing our Bible reading. And then through the uh, modern miracle of technology, our sermon will be up there. There won't be anybody down here. But in the meantime, can you please stand and we'll sing together. Mission Praise 1129, Love Incarnate, Love Divine, Captivates This Heart of Mine. Please stand. With a
This morning's reading is taken from Exodus, chapter 19, verses 1 to 11, and can be found on page 72 of your Pew Bibles. Exodus 19, starting at verse 1. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen that what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you dis- indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. This is the word of the Lord. Sorry I can't be with you in person this morning, but you've got me and someone much more eminent than me uh, on video today. But over the past month we've been having a Bible overview series. We're looking at the broad sweep of the Bible. The first week was called The Pattern of the Kingdom, and we looked at God's wonderful creation. God as Father, Son and Holy Spirit made everything and the creation included Adam and Eve who were placed in the garden. Everything was as it should be. It was bliss. And the second week was called the perished kingdom as the tragic events of the fall unfolded. The serpent tempted Eve to eat the forbidden fruit She took some, she ate it and gave to Adam, and he ate some of the fruit. Through that rebellion against God, sin and death entered our world. And the third week, last week, was called the Promised Kingdom. We spent some time reflecting on covenants, special agreements that God made with Noah, Abraham, Moses and the new covenant through Jesus and we thought particularly about the promises that God made to Abraham promises of a people a land and a blessing our Bible overview is based on this book God's Big Picture written by uh, Vaughan Roberts and uh, in, in this next video Vaughan is outlining the fourth part, which he calls the partial kingdom. A million slaves rescued, a face-off between God and Pharaoh, and a nation is born. This is God's big picture, the partial kingdom, people and blessing.
this course, we're exploring the big picture of the Bible story. All units can be downloaded for free, including printable outlines of the talks and the Bible studies that follow at claygroup.tv and godsbigpicture.co.uk. In the story so far, we've been looking at the beginning of history as described in the Bible. God made a perfect world, but human beings spoiled everything by rebelling against him at the fall. He then makes a promise to one man, Abraham. God could have given up on us and said, in effect, go to hell, a lot of you. But instead, in his amazing grace, he promises to put everything right and restore his kingdom on earth once more. In these next two studies, we'll see how that promise is fulfilled in part in the history of Israel, the partial kingdom. There are four main elements to the promise of the kingdom of God. Three of them, people, blessing, and land, were revealed to Abraham. A fourth is added later, the promise of a king. Those promises point ultimately to the salvation achieved by Jesus Christ. But they are partially fulfilled in the history of Israel. In describing Israel's history, the next few books of the Bible focus on a different promise of God in turn. We're looking in this unit at how God's promises to raise up a people begin to be worked out in Genesis 12 to Exodus 18. And then how his promise of rule and blessing starts to play out from Exodus 19 to Leviticus. We'll then look next time at the promises to give them a place to live in, which is in the books Numbers through to Joshua, and a king in Judges to Chronicles. I should warn you, you'll need to put your seatbelt on. We've completed three of our nine sessions, and we're still only in the first book of the Bible, so we'll have to travel much faster from now on. God's people is the first promise made to Abraham. God said, I will make you into a great nation. And we see this partially fulfilled in Genesis 12 to 50. But there's a problem right from the beginning. Abraham and his wife Sarah can't have children. Something needs to give if this promise is to be fulfilled. Eventually, Abraham thinks he'd better help God out. So he sleeps with Sarah's maid, Hagar, who gives birth to a son, Ishmael. But God makes it clear that his people will not arise from Ishmael's line. Abraham is being taught that if gospel promises are to be fulfilled, only God can do that. Salvation is not by works, so that no one can boast. Sarah is by now an old woman, way past childbearing age. But a miracle happens. She gets pregnant, just as God said she would, and gives birth to a son, Isaac. Now you may wonder why there's so much focus here on marriage and childbirth. Well, it's because the gospel is stake. If God's promises are to be fulfilled, Abraham's family simply can't fizzle out. It has to continue. And sure enough, Isaac marries Rebekah, and they have two boys, Esau and Jacob. Esau is the oldest, and yet it's the scheming Jacob who receives his father's blessing, as if he's the firstborn, and so he's the one whose children are in the line of promise and become the people of God. He certainly doesn't deserve that privilege. He's a very unpleasant man who tricks his brother out of his birthright. Once again, we're being taught an important principle. No one deserves to be part of God's family. It's entirely by grace. Jacob, in turn, has 12 sons, and Joseph is his favorite. Out of jealousy, the others sell their brother into slavery and tell Jacob that he's dead. Joseph is taken to Egypt, where he's put in prison for a crime he didn't commit, but miraculously, he's vindicated and becomes Pharaoh's right-hand man. And so he's in the perfect position to help when his family experience a famine. The famine endangers the future of the gospel because it threatens to snuff out Abraham's descendants before this small family grows into a great nation. But God has overruled everything so that when the brothers come to Egypt desperate for food, Joseph is able to help them and the family tree survives. God is in complete control. He's even able to use great sin and innocent suffering as a means by which his gospel promises are fulfilled. And we see that, of course, supremely at the cross of Christ. Next, we come to God's people, the partial fulfillment in Exodus 1 to 18, and the redemption from slavery in Egypt. The picture painted is of the God who saves. In Genesis, Jacob and his family moved to Egypt to be with Joseph, settled there, and multiplied. But by the beginning of the book of Exodus, Pharaoh has turned them into slaves and treats them cruelly, but God has not forgotten them. 
we're told, the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God had promised that the Israelites would be his people, so he must act to set them free from the Egyptians so that they can belong to him. The rescue operation begins with God appearing in a burning bush. He tells Moses to go to Pharaoh to demand the release of his people, and he reveals a new name to Moses. I am who I am. This usually appears in our Bibles as Lord in capital letters. One possible translation is, I will be what I will be. If Moses wants to know the nature of the God who speaks to him, he'll need to watch what he does. And so we learn from Exodus that God reveals his character through his work of salvation. He is the God who saves. Moses doesn't save the Israelites. God does. In fact, God is the hero of every story in the Bible. It's a book, above all, about God. Next comes salvation by substitution in Exodus 12. The climactic moment comes at the Passover. God announces that he'll kill all the firstborn sons in Egypt in a single night. But he tells the Israelites that they'll escape if they kill a lamb instead. Just imagine that you're the oldest boy in an Israelite home. Do you think you'd sleep? I doubt it very much. You're down every few minutes asking, Dad, have you done it yet? Only once he shows you the blood of the lamb on the door of the house can you relax. You're safe then. And it happens, just as God has said. All the firstborn Egyptians die, but the Israelites survive. So God saves through substitution. His people deserve judgment just as much as anyone else, but God saves them by providing a substitute to die in their place, the lamb for the firstborn son. Finally, we come to salvation by conquest in the crossing of the Red Sea in Exodus 14. After the death of all those Egyptian sons, Pharaoh at last lets the Israelites go. But even then, he changes his mind and leads out his army in deadly pursuit. The Israelites are trapped by the Red Sea, but God parts the waters and they escape to freedom. Pharaoh and his chariots go in, the waters come down, and the Egyptians are drowned. So here is salvation by conquest in the defeat of Pharaoh. And both these acts of salvation, by substitution and by conquest, foreshadow what God will do through Christ on the cross, who died in our place and defeated the powers of evil. So the first promise has begun to be fulfilled. The Israelites are God's people. God's second great promise to Abraham was, I will bless you. That promise is partially fulfilled in Israel's history, as God both gives the Israelites his law and then blesses them with his presence as he comes to live with them. So first, God's law, the Ten Commandments. With the Red Sea behind them, the Israelites reach Mount Sinai, where amidst thunder and lightning, God reveals his law to them in the Ten Commandments. It's important to stress here that salvation comes before the law. They're already his people through the rescue he's achieved, and then they're given the law. God's salvation has always been by undeserved grace, not through obedience. We tend to have a negative attitude to the law, but it's a wonderful thing to be under the law of God. Now that the Israelites are God's people, they must live in a way that reflects his character, and that is the best way to live. We learn from the New Testament that God's law has a number of different functions. It reveals our sin by convicting us of our disobedience. It also reveals our saving by pointing to Jesus as the only one who fully obeyed it and who took upon himself the penalty for the law-breaking of others. And then it reveals God's standards, showing followers of Jesus how he wants us to live. Finally, we come to the partial fulfillment of the promise of God's presence with his people. And we're looking at the end of the book of Exodus. Now that God's people are under his rule again, they're able once more to experience something of that presence with them. The very purpose of redemption is relationship. So God instructs Moses to construct a tabernacle. This is the tent in which his presence will dwell among them as they travel towards the promised land. Now it's a great blessing to have God in their midst, but it also presents a problem. 
How can the holy God live among a sinful people without utterly destroying them? The answer is sacrifice. And the book of Leviticus describes how God institutes a whole system to deal with this problem. The Israelites are to lay their hands on an animal, thus indicating that he represents them and their sin. The priest then kills it as a substitute for them and presents its blood before the presence of God in the tabernacle. It dies in their place so they can live. So in all this, the second promise is partially fulfilled. By the end of Leviticus, the Israelites are under God's law and know something of the blessing of living in relationship with God, with his presence with them. And yet, wonderful as that was, it was severely restricted. Inside the tabernacle was the holy place. And beyond that, the most holy place, which was the focus of God's presence, where the ark with the Ten Commandments inside was stored. And in front of it was a big curtain, which kept everyone out. And once a year, only one man, the high priest, could enter. Clearly, this was a limited relationship, a mere shadow of what was to come. And likewise for the sacrificial system. Of course, no animal is an adequate substitute for a human being. Those sacrifices, offered day after day, were only pointing to the one perfect sacrifice that Jesus, the Lamb of God, offered when he died as our substitute on the cross. At that moment, the curtain in the temple was torn in two by God, and these promises were fulfilled. Anyone who trusts in Christ can come right into the presence of God. So that's it for this unit. In our race through Genesis to Leviticus, we've seen the first two promises of a people and a rule of blessing partially fulfilled. So do come back for our next unit, when we'll open up Numbers to Chronicles and get on to those two remaining promises, a place and a king, in the second part of the partial kingdom. Well, that certainly was a whistle-stop tour by Vaughan of Genesis chapter 12 to the end of Leviticus. And I wanted to ask three questions, three areas that Vaughan spoke about and to ask questions about each of them. And the first is where Vaughan said, God is able to use even great sin and suffering to fulfil his promises. God is able to use even great sin and suffering to fulfil his promises. It's something we see worked out in the lives of many people in the Bible. We see it in the lives of Abraham and Sarah. When they could have been forgiven for wondering how in their old age God could fulfil this promise that Abraham's new name meant that he was the father of of a multitude. And Joseph's life, sold as a slave by his own brothers, wrongly accused and imprisoned, yet at the end of his life he could say this to his brothers. Genesis chapter 50 verse 20. Joseph said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done the saving of many lives. But Joseph could look back on how he was mistreated by his brothers and yet how God was using that to save the lives of his whole family during a famine. But what about us? In times of suffering, in times when life is hard and we can't see what God is doing, do we trust that God is working out his purposes? It's in the words of Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that God is working all things together for good with those who love him who have been called according to his purposes. In those hard times, do we trust God? The second thing that I wanted to reflect on was when Vaughan said, God is the hero of every story in the Bible. We misread the Bible if we think of it simply as an account of good examples, 
good human examples. There are good examples in the Bible, and there are plenty of bad examples that serve as warnings. But at the heart of the Bible is God. He is the hero of every story. And my question is this, is God at the centre of my life? Is Jesus the captain of my soul? The one whom I seek to please? Is God the hero of my story? And the last thing I was to mention from what Paul uh, was saying was where he referred to what he called salvation by substitution as the eldest son of the Passover in Egypt was saved by the blood of the lamb and the door frame. So it is that the blood of Jesus saves us. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says this, In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Jesus provides the once for all salvation by substitution. Through Jesus' blood, we can know full and free forgiveness of our sins when we come to God in repentance. Do you know the joy that God's forgiveness brings? Do you live day by day without the burden of guilt? Because God has taken your sins away, because he has forgiven them. Well, as we close, let me pray for all of us in the words of Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 to 21. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip us with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I had absolutely no idea what to expect from that. And I just want to say, wow. I want to say, wow, because we see 700 years condensed into a few minutes, but every part of it pointing to God's plan of salvation, of John Christ on the cross. I mean, it's... Oh, we neglect the Bible at peril. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think with, with with that with that in mind, we can indeed sing. I need I need a prayer book. I need We're going to be singing 1217 when the, ch as the children come in to, uh, in to join us. But the chorus of this hymn, O to see the dawn, this the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us, took the blame or the wrath, we stand forgiven at the cross. And I think what we just heard so powerfully brought that in, uh, across to us. So please stand uh, to sing this hymn together.
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many gifts and the many blessings that you give us. Please receive our gifts, use them for your glory, we pray, and so the good news of Jesus may sound out in Braintree. We ask it in his name. Amen. Would you like to sit down, please? And our final prayer together. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen.